Planck was a European satellite design, designed to study the cosmic microwave background radiation. Here we're going to talk to a couple of the people who had a lot to do with designing and analyzing the Planck data. Let's go. Jean-Luc, can you give us an idea of how Planck started out? Well, it started a long time ago. In fact, uh, I had the idea of uh, participating in measurement of the cosmological background for many years, and I proposed several experiments, which were not selected. And in 1992, uh, what came about was uh, that uh, low temperature physicist in Grenoble, Alain Benoit, uh, devised a scheme to cool detectors at a very, very low temperature, one-tenth of a degree above absolute zero. So mm -hmm. in 92, we made this proposal to the European agency, to CNES to start with, and to the European Space Agency, to build a satellite around that idea to measure with unprecedented uh, accuracy uh, the cosmological background. À tous de l'ELO, attention pour le décompte final. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, top. So what was, what was the launch and operations like for Planck? Well, the launch was in 2009, which was 16, 17 years after the start I described. And uh, of course, when you have worked on that, not only myself, but many people, 400 scientists on, on the Planck uh, collaboration, plus many, many engineers, uh, industry, and so on. And when it's on top of this big rocket, this huge rocket, yeah, uh, uh, and you, you imagine that it could fail and uh, everything would just blow out and, and so on, it's, it's, uh, it's extremely stressful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so for the 10 minutes, it, it lasted until it reached the, the velocity to be basically uh, shot directly to this Lagrange point at 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth mm -hmm. outside. Uh, I was really uh, following each step I knew uh, of separation of various stages and so on. With, <laughs> well, with boosters falling off yes. and things like that. Okay. And the stuff which could have looked, by looking at that, when the booster, there is kind of an explosion there, and it's just because uh, it's an explosive uh, bolt. Uh, that you see, in fact. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, w I didn't want to be uh, horrified by seeing something like that and not knowing what it was. Okay. Michel. Hi, Ken. <laughs> How are you? Hi, are you? <laughs> so you're the deputy instrument scientist for the high frequency instrument on Planck. Yeah. Could you explain to us how you exactly detect microwave light? So uh, the, the photons are first uh, uh, captured by a telescope which uh, will focus the light uh, on, on the detectors. Mm -hmm. And the detectors are, are, are thermal detectors, which are called uh, bolometers. So the light is absorbed by an absorber. Mm -hmm. and this absorber is heated up because of this absorption. And you measure just the, the, the heating uh, caused by this absorption by using a thermometer, which is a simple resistor, which depends on the temperature. So these detectors are very sensitive because when you cool this detector to very low temperature, uh, say uh, 0.1 Kelvin, uh, which corresponds to 0.1 degrees above the absolute zero, you can reach very high sensitivity. And, and for Planck, and especially for the low frequency channel of the HFI instrument, uh, we are able to see the fluctuation of, of the incoming photon flux of the CMB itself. So who made the dilution part of the cooling system? So this part has been made by a, a French uh, group, uh, especially in Grenoble, associated to an industry, Air Liquide. They have produced this dilution system, uh, which is able to, to be used uh, without gravity, uh, especially in space. Uh, and, and this is really a very nice system uh, that is a, a, a new system that is being used on, on HFI. How exactly do you get these detectors at such a cold temperature? So in, in the technical languages, we, we are using what we call the cryogenic chain. So we have a, a, a chain of, of, of few uh, uh, thermal uh, systems that allow to cool the detector to such low temperature. The first system is just a passive one. So mm -hmm. by just using the, the, the telescope looking at the, at the cold sky, you are able to cool the telescope and the first cryogenic stage to a temperature which is 40 or 50 Kelvin. So 40 
degrees above the zero, the and, absolute zero. And that's zero. just because it's in space. Yes, basically. exactly. J just passive, so, so it's free. You, you just mm -hmm. to put your telescope on the correct configuration, so looking at the cold sky. And after that, what you need to, to go below this temperature is to have a, an active system. So the first stage is, uh, is a system that allows to cool the, the low frequency instrument detectors at 20K. So the first stage, uh, the first active stage is uh, what we call the sorption cooler. It allows to cool the, the low frequency instrument detectors to 20K. And in fact, it's a system that has been uh, made by U our US colleagues from, uh, from GPL especially. So it's based on an extension, a, a Joule Thompson extension of hydrogen. And after that, you have another stage to cool the first part of HFI to 4K, which has been uh, produced by uh, UK, and uh, it's a uh, Joule Thompson of, of, of helium. And the last part is uh, by using two isotopes of, of helium, helium-3 and helium-4. Uh, by using these two isotopes, by mixing them together, you get a, a cooling power that allows you to cool the detector to 100 millikelvin. So it is 0.1 kelvin above the, the absolute zero. Okay. Planck can only look at one point on the sky at a time. So how does it actually cover the entire sky? To make a map of the full sky, we actually spin the telescope so that at any one moment, it looks at a circle around the sky. And with this circle, how do we actually cover the full sky? Well, the point is, with our orbit around L2, the second Lagrange point, we start out scanning the sky like this, but after three months, the Earth moves around the sun, and then we're scanning a circle that's perpendicular to it. So then six months later, we've actually covered the whole sky. After nine months, we've covered it one and a quarter time, uh, one and a half times. And after a full year, we've actually covered the sky twice. What you're gonna be seeing here is actually, we take this full sky and it's really hard to actually project a sphere onto a piece of paper. So what you're seeing now is that we try and project the full sky onto a mole weed projection. And that's what this egg-shaped oval is. Michelle, once you have the data on the satellite, how do we get it here on Earth? So after uh, it has been measured by the detector, it is, uh, it is uh, digitized uh, inside the readout electronics, and after that, transmitted to the, to the onboard computer mm -hmm. and uh, compressed. And after it has been compressed, it, is been, it has been sent to, to the Earth. So you have to know that, uh, that Planck is uh, located on the second Lagrangian point, so it's quite far away from us. So, so you need uh, to, uh, to get uh, the data compressed in order to get all the information on board of the satellite. Jean-Louis, where is the Planck satellite now? The Planck satellite was at this very special point, which is the Lagrange point uh, away from the Earth. But uh, international agreement uh, requires that we remove the satellite from, from this point. Mm -hmm. And so the satellite now, uh, after the end of the observation, has been deorbited, as it's called. Well, the orbit uh, around the Lagrange point is a pseudo orbit. And now it's, uh, it's on a solar orbit, which means uh, it's basically following, following the Earth, more or less, around uh, its motion around the Sun. Okay, like the, like the Earth. Yeah. And wh what's the Planck working on now? So the Planck collaboration, of course, uh, had the role not only of building and testing and so on the, the instruments, but also to analyze the data and, and release them and does the first scientific analysis, which was done. Uh, first uh, in 2013, when uh, we released uh, the temperature maps. Mm -hmm. uh, but until now, uh, we had a, a very hard work, which was to, to get to the noise for the polarization data, mm -hmm. which are typically 100 times weaker than the temperature uh, data, and uh, which contain very interesting information about uh, inflation, especially the inflation, which is this hypothesis about the beginning of the Big Bang, mm -hmm. and, uh, and reionization, first object in the universe, and so on. So that was very important and difficult because that requires a stability uh, of the instrument over several seconds. And uh, so for that, we only succeeded to clean all the instrumental effect uh, that could affect the data only now. And so we are going to release this data uh, in, uh, in the fall now. 
And what do you think that the, the legacy of Planck will be, the scientific legacy? What will it be remembered most for? So, of course, now, uh, the legacy of Planck is the cosmological parameters, mm -hmm. six parameters which describe our universe, plus a few others uh, which are less, less essential. Uh, and that's what's uh, quoted by everybody who works mm -hmm. in extragalactic astronomy or cosmology. But the legacy is the maps of the sky in temperature. And in temperature, it's going to be difficult. Uh, basically, we are limited by fundamental, uh, the basically, the foregrounds uh, of, the of the Milky Way is a limitation which, for temperature, is very difficult to, to, to do better than what Planck has done. So that will be a very, very long legacy. In polarization, it will be a long legacy because the next satellite will probably be, uh, is probably be 10 to 15 years away from, new, from us. But uh, 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 this, this, so this will be a very, very important legacy for, for 10 to 15 years, which is this polarization map.